Hello, welcome back to Oliver's Greenhouse. Um, I hope you've enjoyed some of the previous videos I've put up earlier this week. In this video, and at long last, I've decided that we're going to repot um, and divide my Drosera schizandra. Now, this is a fussy little fellow. If you do grow this, um, then you'll know what you're up against, okay? So, it's a very unusual carnivorous plant. Um, it comes from Queensland in Western Australia. And um, it's interesting for a number, of, uh, a, a number of reasons. Well, basically, they think it's going through an evolutionary step, so it's actually losing its carnivorosity and just re reverting back to relying solely on photosynthesis as a means of uh, providing energy for growth um, and continual survivability of itself. So basically, it grows in a, it's a rainforest sundew, okay? So it grows under sort of in um, low light conditions uh, underneath the uh, rainforest canopy uh, in uh, unbelievably dark conditions. Um, and it obviously it rains a lot there. And if you, if you imagine your main form of gaining food is by digesting uh, insects on your leaf surface using enzymes, uh, if it rains a lot, well, all your prey is going to get washed off. Also, there's lots of ants as well. So if uh, prey gets caught in the mucilage on these plants, ants very often rob the insect off of it. So it's, have, it's, it, it, it's sort of like, it's, it is carnivorous, but it's really not very well suited to where it's actually growing. Now, I got this as a tiny, tiny little plant, and no bigger than sort of my thumbnail, um, quite a while ago. I potted it up, it's just in sphagnum moss, pure long fibre sphagnum moss and some sand. That's all I've been growing it in. Um, and it's divided, it's divided into two plants, okay. I'm quite keen to get it to propagate, which is why I'm going to I'm going to divide it and, uh, and also pot it up and give it a bit more growing space because although it does produce lovely red little flowers, it's like Drosera adelaide and to some degree Drosera prolifera because this is one of the three uh, sisters of Queensland, which means they're all genetically very similar, although they look very different. Okay, so although it does produce flowers, it doesn't really produce any viable seed and its main form of propagation is through runners and plantlets. So basically it divides basically, so it spreads over an area uh, up, up under the ground, um, a bit like uh, Drosera prolifera does, with its, uh, um, it, it, it produces these stolons, these runners, which produce flowers, and then which turn to plantlets at a later date. Um, this does a similar sort of thing, but um, under the ground, basically. So it's divided. We've got two plants here. We're going to have a look at the root system. I've never repotted this. I've had this in this pot for over well over a year now. There's another little tiny plantlet on the side, and um, what we're going to do is we're going to take it apart. I've got some potting media over here, which we're going to be using for this, because I did a bit of research, okay? And although it's recommended to grow this thing in just fibrous, uh, long fibre sphagnum moss with some sand for a bit of drainage, um, you can get quite, quite a chlorotic looking plant. It's quite yellowy, and I don't really like, I don't like that sort of deep, rich green colour of the leaves. It, it, it looks a lot better. I think actually it's going to flower soon as well. It probably isn't the best time to be doing this, but we're going to do it anyway. What the hell? Um, so the research said, Long fibre sphagnum moss is typical, um, although you end up with quite a yellowy, chlorotic looking leaf. I don't want that. So the other thing to put it up is just a normal CP mix. And then apparently you get a much darker, richer, because obviously there is, although it's low, there is much more nutrient availability uh, in um, just pure sphagnum peat moss. So we're going to be using that. Uh, I've mixed in some horticultural sand and some classic perlite. Not a huge amount of perlite, because I want this to stay really, really quite wet. Um, so what I'll do is I'll move you guys. I'll put this over here on the bench for the meantime. Move you in a bit closer, and we'll have a look at um, have a look at this as we take it apart. Okay, so here's the potting media we're going to be using. Uh, like as I discussed before, it's just a typical CP mix, but with a lot more horticultural sand in it, um, just to give it a little bit extra drainage, and not quite so much perlite. There's still a fair bit in there. There's probably I don't know 10, 15 percent perlite in here, but this is the mix we're going to be using. I'll just give you a close-up of the, of, obviously, of uh, Drosera schizandra, the one we're going to be uh, dividing. If I sort of walk around the tripod without crashing into it, I hope that's going to focus. Right here we go. So this started out as a plant no bigger than this one by my finger here, and then over the year and a half that I've had it, it's divided to form two plants. So we're going to divide those guys up and repot it into what will look like um, disproportionately large pots, but I want to really encourage this thing to produce more and more little plantlets so I can actually start to sell them, um, because um, they aren't, it's not a very easy to find um, carnivorous plant, but well, I didn't find it, 
uh, particularly difficult to track down, certainly not in the UK. So um, there might be a niche in the market there for those. So that's, uh, that's the potting media discussed. If I just zoom out, we can have a look at um, There we go. So these are the pots I'm going to be using. These are quite big. I mean, they're, I think, maybe even six inches across. Um, two of these, one for each plant. They're approximately the same size. Um, probably haven't mixed up quite enough of this. I never usually do. I'm not very good at, uh, uh, good at volumes here. So we're going to divide this into that. First thing we'll do is we'll take that apart and we'll have a look at the roots because I've got no idea what this thing looks um, subterraneanly, no idea. So, spare pot there for the old potting media. Okay, so it's probably going to be quite tricky to do this without covering the entire plant in, uh, in stuff, uh, in the potting media, because that's just the nature of the beast. But hopefully this in here will hold together really well. I can see there's a couple of roots starting to come through the bottom of it. Excuse my hand for a minute. Right. So this is what it was growing in before. It's just basically pure sphagnum moss with some perlite and some sand so it's going to probably be quite difficult to pick all this apart without damaging any of the roots and it's got these typical very thick roots if i hold it up you might be able to see it over my finger there it's typically these these dark wiry uh, roots very similar to uh, drosera adelaide there's another one over here as well so it's going to be very difficult as i separate these because being sphagnum moss, it's sort of wound its way in through the media really well. It's really bound it up, so I'm going to be quite careful. Get rid of all this sphagnum moss on here. This little plant in it here has actually arisen from a root which has gone down into the media, then come back up, and it's actually emanating from the root itself, if I hold it up, you may just be able to see that there. I don't know whether that's in focus or not, but it's actually coming out of the root. So we'll have to be careful with that. I have to snip him off. It has started to produce its own roots, so we'll be able to snip it off and pot it up separately into a much smaller pot. I'm going to get as much of this off of here as possible. And there's another one there as well. So there's a couple of where, where these roots hit the surface, they obviously produce um, plantlets very readily. So that's going to be good. It's going to be give us something to divide off of. What I'm going to have to do is have a look in between these plants to see whether they're sharing the same piece of roots or whether they are two completely separate plants. Because at the moment, it is not apparent no, they're two separate plants. There we go. Now they've come apart quite easily. They've divided into two. So now we've got two separate plants. Just trying to be very careful with these because obviously being covered in mucilage, they want to pick up bits of... Uh... There's another plant there which is coming up as well. I don't know whether you'll be able to see that on camera. You might be able to. It's sort of in between my finger and thumb. It's very small. So this one here is actually producing quite a few little plantlets. What I might do is actually leave these on for the meantime because they don't have enough of an established root system, I don't think, to survive on their own. So we're going to leave those attached to the roots in which they're actually emanating from. There's actually quite a few little plantlets here, all coming off of the root system of this one plant here. So what I'll do is I'll uh, just pull off some of these dead leaves. Not really, not very effectively anyway. And what we're going to do is stick them to one side, like that. And we're going to fill up our new pot. Pop them down there for the minute so they're out of the way. Now this isn't soaking wet, This is a, it's damp but it's not saturated, just to make life all that bit easier uh, for actually putting, uh, getting it to tamp down around the root system of the plant. So this is fatal, my hands like this, for picking these up because uh, 
everything just gets absolutely caked in bits of peat moss. Okay. So here's the first plant. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to support it underneath like that. And then just using my hands, just gently push the new potting media in and around it like this. It's very tricky to do because what you don't want to do is get any of this on the surface of the leaves, if at all possible. So it's a bit of an operation, but with, with patience, it's quite doable. And just gently push it down with your fingers, just to firm the roots in. I'm gonna swap hands now, so I'm afraid your view might be slightly obstructed for a minute. If you do get a bit on there, as you just see me doing there, you can, if you're lucky, if it's not too much of a sticky leaf surface, give it a little blow. Hopefully that'll stand up now. Yep. Now we can just delicately fill the void up. Now I've planted it quite high because I want it, I want to, I don't, I'm not going to top dress this with anything. So I want the soil surface to be very much near the top of the pot when it's fully, when it's fully in there. I just keep thumbing it in, working round the base of the plant. Just trying to be very careful not to get any peat particles on the surface of the leaves. Now these guys really do like some serious shade levels. If you leave these guys in anything, um, you know, greater than diffuse sunlight for any length of time you'll find the leaves scorch very quickly. Um, this was actually living inside of, a, uh, inside of a jam jar on the windowsill inside the house for most of its life. It's been out in the greenhouse over winter, um, but as soon as temperatures start to rise again, it'll be going back inside because another thing about this, uh, this plant is it cannot handle warm temperatures. Basically, if you can keep this thing below 25 degrees centigrade, you're doing well. And that's not easy to achieve, certainly not in the greenhouse. That's why it'll be going back in the house um, once uh, the temperatures start rising because it's, you know, it, it's regularly over 27 degrees centigrade in here in the summer, almost all the time, uh, certainly during the daytime. Uh, my nighttime temperatures might drop down to sort of like 17, 18, depending on the ambient temperature outside, but you know, it, it's, a, it's a warm greenhouse in summer. So well, the orchids like it, and most of the other, they are the carnivorous plants are more than happy in those environments. If you were to plant this and leave this guy out here, it would, it would soon, it would go yellow first of all, and then it would just fade away, fade back to nothingness very quickly. They will not handle it. So you bear that in mind, super humid, and cool, so that's why it makes it a particularly tricky one to uh, one to grow. Drosera prolifera also doesn't like particularly high heat. That's one of the sisters of this plant. Drosera adelaide is almost indestructible. I've grown it in a real range of conditions. It, it's been in the shade in here, and uh, it's been fine. Although it does tend to, you get longer leaves, much longer sort of green leaves. And when the flowers um, emerge, they don't tend to be red, they tend to be sort of like a weird sort of pale creamy green colour, which isn't really very ideal. That's a, I mean, that's a real indicator that the plant's not getting enough light. I've grown them in the terrarium at work where they've regularly been sort of, you know, in the 30 degree centigrade sort of area. And they've had no, no um, negative impact on them at all. They sort of go quite like a bright striking red colour, but they gr just keep on growing. So, but these guys are very, very fussy. So, this is this one done. If I pull him up to, you should be able to see him. So there he is in contrast to the, uh, to the pot. That's how high um, I've potted him up. And then these guys at the moment, they live underneath the benching behind you guys. So if I, if I pan the camera around, you'll be able to see what I'm talking about. 
So I can't have them on any of the benches because it's just too bright. So they actually live, see the pink box? And then you'll see that orange saucer. They actually live in that orange saucer at the moment. It's always nice and shaded down there. So that's where they go and live because everywhere else is just too bright in the greenhouse. All right, I'll just pop the next one up. Hopefully we've got enough. I think we're going to be okay for once, which is a real rarity at Oliver's greenhouse because usually I uh, never mix up enough. That's sort of my, my signature move, really. Right, let's pick this fellow up. Right, now, like I said, this guy's producing little plantlets already, so I need to be quite careful about where these roots end up because we don't want to bury. So what I'm going to have to do is hold on to any of the little plantlets which are emerging. And same thing again, just going to slide my fingers underneath the main plant. Make sure I've got that exposed root with the uh, new plant coming off of it. I just fill in again and firm in gently with my fingers. is really tricky. I mean, it's it's tricky potting up any of the uh, carnivorous plants, really, because, and I'm sure many of you do grow them, um, and I, I, I've certainly been guilty of it a few times. You're potting away there, and a big lump of, uh, of peat moss drops out of your fingers and that's straight on the plant, and that's it. You know, you've got to wash it off, but by washing it off, you wash off all the mucilage as well, and, you know, part of the draw of these plants is these sort of, like, attractive droplets of um, of sort of like clear liquid which you know glint in the sun and uh, are so attractive to carnivorous plant growers and there's nothing worse than looking at one that you've accidentally smothered with peat because they just look rubbish. Also feeding these um, you've got to be careful of what you feed them I mean I feed almost all of my um, carnivorous plants with fish food I use uh, just normal fish flakes um, um, for the Nepenthes, you can use Nishi Koi pellets. Just drop a Koi pellet inside the pitcher, and they really like being fed because these are prolific feeders in the wild. You know, I mean, the, the environment, not so much schizandra, but a lot, you know, the environment that a lot of these plants inhabit are bogs, uh, you know, where, um, you know, um, insects are going to be rife. So they, you, you put them into this unnatural um, sort of cultivated growing environment and uh, they're not getting anything like the amount of food they'd be getting in the wild. And you can really increase growth rate you know, exponentially by feeding, so I highly recommend it. Even my capensis I feed, and depending on uh, my, my feeding regimes, usually sort of once a week for most of them. And uh, the beauty about the fish flakes is, just grab a, grab a couple of, um, grab a little pinch between your fingers and thumbs, and especially if your plants are growing, uh, like the Bamani over to my right here, on a tray, you can just crush the flakes between your fingers and you get like a fine scattering of dust um, over, which, which soon adheres to the tentacles. And the beauty about that is as well, it, um, it just dissolves. It's not, like a, it's not like you're leaving a large amount or large um, piece of food uh, on the leaf surface to go mouldy. Um, the, the fish food flakes just kind of dissolve, disappear, and um, so you know you, there isn't so much of a, a chance of, of mould, which can be a real issue because what happens is you feed them, then they get mould on them, and then before you know it, they've uh, the leaf starts to burn and die off. These will burn extremely quickly. Even freeze-dried uh, bloodworm, if you feed that to this plant, uh, it will burn holes in the leaves. You get like shot holing in the leaves. So you've got to be really careful. But I've um, I fed them fish food flakes uh, and had no detrimental effect whatsoever. So there we have it. That's both of these. Uh, that's both of these um, divided now. So we've got gone from one a clump of Drosera schizandra to two Drosera schizandra. Was I move you and, uh, and we'll have a little look. Okay, so there we have it. Two potted up Drosera schizandra. This one I think is going to go into flower pretty soon, so if that does, I'll uh, make sure I get some footage of that. Um, 
I hope this uh, you've enjoyed this video. Um, if you have, don't forget to give us a thumbs up like down below. And uh, if you feel like it, subscribe to my channel. Thanks for watching. Um, um, well, that's a tits. <laughs>